small factory in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, that's probably the only one of its kind in the world. It looks like any other cabinet maker's shop until you notice the men working there. The Disabled Civilians Workshop is no government-run charity. It's a private company, turning out well-made, unpainted furniture and specialties and selling them in the open market. True, it does receive some help from both Saskatchewan and Dominion governments, but it's incorporated and intended to run at a profit and to prove that disabled people, given a chance and the right job, can be independent, self-supporting citizens. All the charity in the world couldn't buy the self-respect these people earn in the workshop. It isn't always easy. You've got to find a job that uses only a man's good limbs. And usually, you've got to train him from scratch. Take Harry, for example. Herb Jenkins, the manager, brought him in one day to see Sam Cravenchuk, the foreman. Harry had had polio and his legs weren't much good. But you don't need legs to make mortises on a drill press. Sam took him over and showed him how. Harry'd never done any woodwork, but he was a smart boy and he wanted more than anything in the world to get a job he could do and earn his own living. One thing you can always be sure of, give a man with a disability a chance and he'll put everything he has into it. The workshop exists to give people like Harry that chance. Disabilities are not confined to men. If anything, jobs are scarcer for handicapped women than for men. Under the patient guidance of Mrs. Parker, head of the garment section, women who have never been able to do anything make skirts, slacks, hospital uniforms, and their own wages. Audrey is just beginning, learning to hem towels. It's a little tough for Audrey because she was born deaf, can neither speak nor hear. In spite of it, she's quick to learn, proud of her increasing skill. She'll be a fine seamstress soon, says Mrs. Parker, able to hold her own anywhere. The workshop encourages its employees to find other jobs when they're able to make room for new trainees. Losing its best workers that way makes economical operation of the shop difficult. Yet the garment section has been paying its way so well that it proposes to triple in size this year. Tilly Ingold, who has become head cutter, could probably use her skill to make more money elsewhere. But she's so full of enthusiasm for the new spirit the workshop gives to disabled people like herself, she has an artificial leg, that she wants to remain as long as they need her. Right now, there are 17 handicapped workers in the garment shop. But the workshop extends its opportunities to women all over the province whose disabilities are so great that they cannot leave their homes. Margaret Pladson spends her life in an immovable iron brace. She can't ever sit down. But she can run a sewing machine standing up. The workshop keeps Margaret and nearly 40 others like her supplied with kits of cut-out women's slacks to sew and finish at home pays her on a piecework basis. For the first time in her life, Margaret can earn her own money. Makes me feel I have a right to live, she says proudly. Her pride and that of all the people in the workshop is more than just a glow of independence for money earned. It's a pride of craftsmanship, of proving that they, in spite of seemingly insuperable handicaps, can do a job as well as anybody. That pride shows in the goods in their own showroom in the shipments that go to hospitals and department stores. It shows in the fit and finish of the furniture in their stockroom. And most of all, it shows in the faces of people like Harry, who has learned to be an expert at his job, learned that there is a place for him in a world of ordinary people.